So I felt led to what well, an amazing passage of scripture, um, one of the most powerful prayers um, in Ephesians 3 and verse 14. And we'll be using this as a foundation and then um, exploring some of the themes from it from there. Uh, so Ephesians 3 and verse 14. When Paul is praying for the Ephesian church, church that he knew very well, and he says, for this reason, and that's, he's been referring to them not getting discouraged by his sufferings for them. Uh, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So it focuses this prayer on the Ephesian church but also on all Christians because it talks about you together with all the saints and us and them having the full power to know all of God's love and grace through faith. Now someone will say to me Mike how can we know something that surpasses knowledge? How can we know this love that surpasses knowledge, which on the surface sounds like a contradiction? We will come to that, I promise, before we finish, but we're going to explore other things around it in the meantime. Because how do we begin to understand about Christ's love? Well, I think the obvious place is to start with what he did. With the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the fact that Jesus, speaking with his disciples as they journeyed around um, Israel, in ministry, Jesus knew and foretold several times what that would cost him. So we've got various headings that we'll look at, and the first of them um, is actually looking at the scripture that um, Mervyn shared with communion. And I put, put that under the heading that we can know about the love of God because of the prophecies in the Old Testament. And that passage in Isaiah is possibly the most vivid portrayal, prophecy of Jesus on the cross about how he would suffer, what he would endure for us. It was written some 700 years before Jesus actually went to the cross. And we can possibly link all the content of that chapter or so in Isaiah together, maybe under three headings. First of all, the servant suffering. Secondly, his silent suffering. And thirdly, his saving suffering. So the servant suffering, the, the passage starts with, see my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And just as there were many who were appalled at him and his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, so he will sprinkle many nations. And again, later um, 
in the passage, um, we see about the sufferings of Jesus that, as Mervyn read for us, surely he took our infirmities, he carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes or by his wounds we are healed. God's son Jesus willingly went through suffering for us. And that is a huge feature of the extent of God's love. You know, if we put it back to ourselves, how would we react when someone is in need? How far would we go? There's the scripture that Jesus told us that greater love has no man than he laid down his life for his friends. And we see in that passage that he suffered silently. He didn't make a big song and dance about it. He didn't draw attention to himself about it. In verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and just as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. There was humility. There was not attention-seeking. And that is love. And there was saving suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. And in verse 10 and verse 12, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied because he poured out his life unto death. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. So we see the love and the extent of the love of Jesus firstly through the prophecies in the Bible in the Old Testament. Secondly, we see the extent of the love of Christ through his actions in the world, the miracles of healing, many of which we're told were as a result of Jesus looking upon those who are ill, those who are lame, those who are blind, and having compassion. You know, God has compassion on us. His love is such that he feels for us. He wants the best for us. He wants to lift us up. We see miracles of providing. In the New Testament, we see the feeding of the 5,000 and many, many more times when Jesus provided when there was need. We see miracles involving the natural world. Probably the most well-known is the calming of the storm when the disciples were in the boat terrified and Jesus came to them on the water. All of these actions of Jesus show his love, his compassion, his giving of himself. Thirdly, and possibly ultimately, we see the extent of the love of Jesus because of the cross. Perhaps you could say that it's most vividly portrayed in Mark's gospel, uh, largely because Mark is the shortest gospel, the most compact, and because the events happen you know, one after the other, very quickly we get some idea of the extent of Jesus' love in Mark's Gospel in, in chapter 15. Looking very briefly at the events, we see that there was that pain when Pilate ordered him to be beaten, to be flogged when he wanted to release him. 
before he handed Jesus over to be crucified. We see it then when the soldiers put a crown of thorns and jammed it over his head. The fact that they spat on Jesus taunted him. And we see it as Jesus started carrying the cross and the weight of it and the weight of our sin and the sin of all the world called him to stumble. And uh, Simon from Cyrene was uh, called to give a hand. We see it as the nails were driven into his hands and his feet. And we hear it, that pain on the cross as Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Perhaps the most vivid visual portrayal of this is in Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ. And I know myself when I saw it, that film in the cinema, at one point I had to almost bury my head in my hands and say, not more not. It was so graphic and so vivid how Jesus suffered and suffered for each one of us, showing the extent of his love for us. Perhaps we can then begin to understand more about God's love because of the fact that, as we've sung earlier, there is an unbreakable link between God and his people. He's never going to let us go. He's always going to be there for us. And in Romans, Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And we have in Romans 8 and uh, verse 35, a list of various things that possibly we might think could separate us from the love of Christ. After he's posed that question, Paul says, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So there's seven features there. <laughs> and then there's another 10 in verse 38. And Paul says that I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth. So that's another nine. And just in case Paul reckons that someone might come up with something that he's not mentioned, he says, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul had said earlier, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love it. Sometimes things hit us and we may have doubts. but we could personalize it. We know that in all things, God works for the good of Mike or Claire or Mary or Keith or Rachel or Merv or Rita or Di or Di. And we could go around the whole congregation. Nothing is going to happen that is going to stop God loving us now that we've found him as Lord and Saviour. So that unbreakable link between God and his people gives us, as his people, some idea of the height and length, breadth and depth of his love. And if that doesn't convince you, well, what about that definition 
of love that is given in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And when we take together those features of the love of Christ, we've got something that's going to care for us, that's never going to let us go, that's never going to demand its own way or seek for itself. It's a forgiving love. It doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices in truth. It always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres, and never fails. And we could, and this might be worth you doing sometime at home, looking that passage up in 1 Corinthians 13 from verse 4 and substituting the word God or the word Jesus for love. We do it quickly now. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God never fails. Maybe, maybe we could do another substitution. Challenge for each one of you. Challenge for me. Because we as God's people are meant to live in love with all people. So how about putting your name where it says love? Mike is patient. Mike is kind and so on. Because not only is there this experience of what love is like, this definition of what love is like, there's also, to help us understand the love of God, there's the love of God's people. We stick by each other. We're family. We care for each other. We help each other. We support each other. We pray for each other. And so trying to draw some of these threads together, the fact that we know about the love of Christ because of the prophecies in the Old Testament. We know because of the actions of Jesus when he was in this world. We know because of the cross. We know because of the unbreakable link between God and his people. Because of what love is like and is defined and because of the witness and love from his people. How can we know something that surpasses knowledge? Well, God's love is total. If we take that passage we started with in Ephesians, God's love is total. It reaches every experience of our life. There is nothing we go through or have gone through that doesn't reflect and show in some way, and if it's bad and God stays with us, 
That's how God's love may be revealed. It's wide. It covers the whole range of our experiences. It's long from the moment we're born to the moment we leave this world and die and go to glory. High. Well, it's higher than those greatest moments of joy and celebration and enthusiasm or whatever that we have ever felt. God's love is higher than that. It's deep. It reaches down to the deepest parts of our lives, the dis disappointments, the discouragements, the despair, the depression. And so in all respects, God's love is greater and beyond everything we have and ever can go through. But we feel God's love in those circumstances. We taste and see. We can testify to the fact that often it is in our bleakest moments, humanly speaking, that we know that God's there. We know the miracle that he brings us through a situation, that he helps us, he provides for us. He sends another Christian along at just the right time to ring us, to call on us, to pray for us. And so in that sense, although God's love surpasses all knowledge, we know it, we experience it, we feel it, we can testify to it, and we know that we can receive more and more of it through the Holy Spirit. And so we can be filled to the measure, as Paul says, of all the fullness of God. And I don't know about you, but there are many times that when there's a challenge, yes, I do pray about it. But then particularly before I go to sleep, I turn it over and over and over and over. And I have a sleepless night and I wonder why. Because sometimes in the middle of the night, I just sense the Lord saying, I'm here. Or trust me or pray and at that point when I do that that stress that fear that concern is lifted turn to the Lord he will hear he will answer he will fill and God wants us to live not second-rate Christian, he wants us, us to live in the fullness of what Jesus has for us and what he's accomplished for us and what he does for us and in the power of the Holy Spirit who he gives to us freely and daily and who dwells within us. And he wants us to live for him as best as ever we can. And he wants to, to live in victory, to share and to show his love to the world outside. To share, and I guess the news about the uh, children's morning on Tuesday, I saw some, something about the poster saying, can't, no more were full um, on Facebook. And I was just reminded of those last two verses that Paul mentions here, which I thought we could just use as a prayer. I'll repeat them twice first so that you take them in again, and then we'll pray them. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, not just a little bit more, not just as much as we need, and, and, and yes, there's a, immeasurably more. 
that all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him, Jesus, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So let's pray that now together. Lord, in our midst, in our lives, in those who are in need that we know about, Lord, to you who are able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to your power that is at work within us, to you, Jesus, be glory in the church and God our Father in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.